All right, so we are back, and we've been talking about Pater, and we've been talking about aestheticism, and so now let's turn to Oscar Wilde, and we're going to look in particular at the preface to his novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, and uh, you all know about The Picture of Dorian Gray, don't you? I mean, just the basic story. <clears throat> the basic story has to do with uh, what if, what if a painter, or I mean this could presumably be any kind of artist, but in this case it's a painter, could paint a picture of a young man in his youth and beauty and, and strength and all of that, and that he would not undergo any physical changes no matter how dissipated a life he lived, that only the painting would undergo those changes. <laughs> so that, you know, he could stay out drinking all night, you know, and not get any sleep, and, uh, you know, just living this, this very raucous sort of dissipated life, uh, but he would always stay the same physically. But only the painting would get older and older and older and older and would bear all of the signs, the external signs of his life of dissipation. Well, anyway, and I, I won't tell you how this ends, by the way, in case you do want to read this at some point. And it's been several times made into, uh, into films, and uh, including, I think, the last one is a made-for-television film. But let's look at his preface. This is a very famous manifesto about art, aestheticism, and what came to be known as the art for art's sake movement, which is basically what we were talking about a little while ago with aestheticism. Art for art's sake. Not art for the sake of morality, not art for the sake of religion, not art for the sake of politics, not art for the sake of society or social change or social amelioration of problems, but uh, art simply for the sake of art. Ars gratia artis. Where have you seen that, by the way? Anybody remember? You have seen that many times, that Latin phrase, Ars gratia artis. Movies. MGM. Yeah, MGM. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I've got up here on the screen compare French symbolisme. Symbolisme was a movement in the late 19th century in French aesthetics and French poetry. And somebody was asking me earlier about, well, what about music during this period? Actually, one of the things that, that people were playing around with was that music might be the most pure form of art because it was something that would enter into our souls, as it were, and could uh, not only give meaning but also uh, to give us excitement or to give us uh, a, a kind of sense of peace or whatever the feeling was, but that music was much closer to pure feeling and to pure imagination than the other arts. And so the symboliste, among other things, and I don't mean in all of their poetry or all of the time, but the symboliste often were playing with the notion of how sound could take over in poetry, and, and poetry could become more and more like music in certain respects. So that uh, the French actually thought that our greatest poet, I mean our being American, greatest poet was Edgar Allan Poe. And of course, most Americans and American literary critics and American literary scholars hoot when they, uh, when they hear that or when they say that. But you can understand it if you understand where the, the symbolists were coming from. 
what they were talking about was that Poe was not presenting us with a poetry of ideas, certainly not in any serious way. And, you know, you don't go to Poe to find out anything about the meaning of life or raising the big questions. What you go to Poe for is simply that, that musical play with language. And that was what they found so attractive in France at the time. <clears throat> and there were French poets who were trying to, to capture something like that in the French language. But also there were other things, such as the, the kind of cult of aestheticism and of art for art's sake, and even a rebelliousness against the conventions of bourgeois or middle class morality and life in general, as we'll see in just a moment. Which leads to the characterization, if we can go back to the screen just for a moment, leads to the characterization of this art, whole artistic movement, which was an international artistic movement, as a period of decadence. As a period of decadence. Uh, because here were people who claimed at any rate not to take seriously moral values in the conventional sense of moral values. Uh, and therefore, they were regarded as if they were decadent. And they even reveled, by the way, in their defiance of middle class values. So let's look at the preface to the picture of Dorian Gray. <clears throat> and this is written as a kind of manifesto. The artist is the creator of beautiful things. Well. That doesn't seem to be arguable, does it, really? Uh, and it's certainly the same kind of thing that we've seen some of our other writers already talking about. To reveal art and conceal the artist is art's aim. Now, that's an interesting statement, because what he's saying there is that the goal of art is not to display or promote the artist as a kind of personality but really to draw attention to the artfulness of the art. And of course, that's also somewhat ironic for anyone who knows anything about Wilde's own lifetime, because Wilde very much promoted himself and a certain kind of popular image of himself. The critic is he who can translate into another manner or a new material his impression of beautiful things. And presumably what he means by that is that you can write an essay in prose about a poem. So you can translate into another medium your impressions of the work of art. Or you can write about a piece of music. Or you can write about a painting. <clears throat> the highest, as the lowest, form of criticism is a mode of autobiography. And notice that's not far from what Pater was saying. Because Pater was saying that criticism, in effect, is a kind of autobiography if it's a matter of trying to figure out what it is in and about me that is so struck by this painting. But also, that can become the lowest form of criticism if all it is is just blathering on about yourself without ending up telling us something about the work of art. Those who find ugly meanings in beautiful things are corrupt without being charming. <laughs> That's a wonderful comment. <laughs> corrupt without being charming. Now, of course, Wilde, in his witticisms, would say things like, oh, you know, it's, it's perfectly all right to be corrupt, so long as you're charming about it. Uh, this is a fault, he says. Well, OK. Those who find beautiful meanings in beautiful things are the cultivated. For these, there is hope. And by the way, he's going to shift the values around so that you can write a beautiful work of art 
let's say, a beautiful novel, a beautiful poem about something that in a conventional sense would not be moral. Okay? Uh, think of all of the debates that went on, not just in the 19th century, but particularly in the 20th century, about things like D.H. Uh, Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover and whether or not it could even be published legally or James Joyce's Ulysses, and whether or not it could even be published legally. I mean, these books were published underground but, uh, and circulated, but, but uh, it was against the law to, to publish them. OK, so what does he say? There is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. He does not want to apply the category of morality to literature that art should be judged as art. That's what art for art's sake means. Not according to moral standards, whether it conforms or does not conform to certain moral criteria. Books are well written or badly written. This is all. This is all. The 19th century dislike of realism is the rage of Caliban seeing his own face in a glass. Which is another one of his witty remarks, because remember who Caliban is in Shakespeare's The Tempest, and also Caliban upon Setebos of Browning that we, we saw, who's a kind of half-human man. The 19th century dislike of Romanticism is the rage of Caliban not seeing his own face in a glass, which, of course, again, he has all of these witty paradoxes, but he's making a point. <clears throat> the moral life of man forms part, part of the subject matter of the artist, but the morality of art consists in the perfect use of an imperfect medium the perfect use of an imperfect medium. No artist desires to prove anything. And then, of course, another one of his witticisms. Even things that are true can be proved. But, you know, no artist desires to prove anything. Well, tell that to Milton. Was Milton not an artist? Okay. Uh, I mean, interesting questions. Was Wordsworth not an artist? I mean, Wordsworth is trying to prove things. Okay. Even things that are true can be proved. No artist has ethical sympathies. And ethical sympathy is an, in an artist is an unpardonable mannerism of style. Well, again, you know, notice, I mean, he can be very funny. <clears throat> Thought and language are, to the artist, instruments of an art. Oh, excuse me, I skipped. I skipped. Let's go back. No artist is ever morbid. The artist can express everything. Okay? Don't criticize the artist for presenting us with something that we don't want to see, with something which is sordid or tawdry. Uh, the artist can express everything. The only question is whether or not the artist expresses it well. Because remember, the only thing is how well a book is written. Thought and language are to the artist instruments of an art. Vice and virtue are to the artist materials for an art. From the point of view of form, the type of all the arts is the art of musician. Okay, which goes back to the question that we were talking about during the break. You know, what do these guys have to say about music? Okay, so that the the most perfect art is the art of music. There was a uh, a nineteenth century uh, German aesthetician named Baumgartner who wrote about this and uh, argued that music was the purest of the arts for the reasons that we were discussing a little while ago. From the point of view of feeling, the actor's craft is the type. 
all art is at once surface and symbol. So you can find the surface level of meaning in a work of art, but there will always be something else, or at least one hopes that there is always something else. Those who go beneath the surface do so at their peril. Those who read the symbol do so at their peril. It is the spectator and not life that art really mirrors. And here he goes back to the notion of what is there about us that is mirrored in the work of art? Not just how does the work of art mirror the world around us, but how does it somehow or another mirror what is inside us? Diversity of opinion about a work of art shows that the work of art is new, complex, and vital. And of course, there's often been a lot of controversy about art, especially something which is new, complex, and vital. In the 19th century, when the first Impressionist exhibit was opened in Paris, there were riots in the streets. They had to call out the, uh, the gendarme to control the mobs. When uh, the Rites of Spring was, was performed, Stravinsky's Rites of Spring was performed, uh, once again, riots in the streets in Paris. Okay? Uh, I mean, people got very upset about these things. Flaubert dared to write a novel about Madame Bovary in which a middle-class woman, not just some woman of the streets, but a middle-class woman, not a working-class woman, but a middle-class woman, has not one affair, but she has two affairs with these different guys. And she ends up, not out of a sense of guilt, but because she gets trapped in circumstances that she can no longer control and she's about to be ruined, she ends up committing suicide. And Flaubert's publisher was actually hauled into court. And the charge against the novel was that it defamed the womanhood of France. Okay? Well, okay. Diversity of opinion about a work of art shows that the work is new, complex, and vital. When critics disagree, the artist is in accord with himself. We can forgive a man for making a useful thing as long as he does not admire it. The only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely. All art is quite useless. And of course, what he means by that, and once again, he's being witty, as he often is, but uh, one of the things that, that he's doing here, of course, is he's pointing to the problem which others had pointed to before, such as the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant. What is art for? Does it serve some kind of purpose beyond itself? Now, many of the ancients had used a form, excuse me, a formula, such as Horace, the, uh, the Roman poet and literary critic, used this. That poetry, and by extension the other arts, should fulfill the goals of being both dulce, at utile, sweet and useful. Okay? So it pleases us by its sweetness, but it also is useful in leading us towards something beyond itself. Some view of life or of the correct life. Plato in his Republic, in Book 10, first wanted to expel all of the poets from the well-ordered republic. Why? He says, 
Should we be teaching Homer to our children? I mean, after all, look at what you find in Homer. The most unedifying descriptions of the activities of the gods and goddesses who are engaged in these bedroom farces, you know, hopping into bed with one another and regardless of, of who is married to whom and so on and so on and so on. How edifying is that? Well, notice the premise in that argument is that art should be edifying, right? And so he finally decides, okay, we will let the poets in the back door of the well-ordered republic, so long as the poets follow the guidance of the philosopher kings in teaching people to admire virtue and to despise vice. Well, okay. Now notice that that's totally counter to what Oscar Wilde is saying here, right? And it's totally counter to the whole art for art's sake movement or to aestheticism. And this, of course, is what earned the reputation of many of these people for, quote, decadence, unquote. Well, let's briefly go, if we can go back to the screen, please. Let's briefly talk about the question, how do Wilde's own poems fit with this artistic manifesto? Let's look at two poems. A Tenebris. Oh, no, let's look at these in reverse order. That might be more interesting, actually. Let's look first at the harlot's house. We, and what we're going to find out is that uh, the, the, the person who is speaking in the poem is a man. And he's with his woman friend, and, and apparently they are romantically involved. Though we don't know exactly what that means. We caught the tread of dancing feet. We loitered down the moonlit street and stopped beneath the harlot's house. They're listening to the music. They hear the music out on the street. And so they stop outside the harlot's house. Inside, above the din and fray, we heard the loud musicians play the Troya Liebes Hertz of Strauss. Like strange mechanical grotesques, making fantastic arabesques spinning around. The shadows raced across the blind. The blinds are drawn, but they can see the shadows of the people inside as projected onto the blinds. We watched the ghostly dancers spin to sound of horn and violin, like black leaves wheeling in the wind, like wire-pulled automatons, slim silhouetted skeletons went sidling through the slow quadrille. This is what's going on in the harlot's house. Then took each other by the hand and danced a stately saraband. Their laughter echoed thin and shrill. Sometimes a clockwork puppet pressed a phantom lover to her breast. Sometimes they seemed to try to sing. Sometimes a horrible marionette came out and smoked the cigarette upon the steps like a live thing. Notice that it sounds like everybody's in there having a, a great time, lots of fun and so forth, except notice that some of this imagery is really quite negative. Sometimes, well, we did that, okay. Then turning to my love, I said, the dead are dancing with the dead, the dust is whirling with the dust. But she, she heard the violin and left my side and entered in. Love passed into the house of lust, the love that he 
thought they had for one another, she has abandoned now by going into the house. Then suddenly the tune went false. The dancers wearied of the waltz. The shadows ceased to wheel and whirl. And down the long and silent street, the dawn with silver sandaled feet crept like a frightened girl. Now, does this poem accord with the manifesto? Art for art's sake? Well, okay. Let's look at A Tenebris. Out of the Darkness. Come down, O Christ! O Christ! And help me. Reach thy hand, for I am drowning in a stormier sea than Simon on thy lake of Galilee. How is he drowning? The wine of life is spilt upon the sand. The wine of life is spilt upon the sand. My heart is as some famine murdered land. My heart is dead. Soaked with wine as I have been, my heart is dead. I've been living a life of pleasure and for pleasure, and my life is empty. And so I call upon Christ. My heart is as some famine-murdered land whence all good things have perished utterly. And well I know my soul in hell must lie if this night before God's throne should stand. He sleeps perchance or rideth to the chase like Baal when his prophets howled that name from morn to noon on Carmel's smitten height. Nay, peace, I shall behold before the night the feet of brass, the robe more white than flame, the wounded hands, the weary human face. Christ. Okay, now think about this in terms of the manifesto that we saw just a moment ago. Art for art's sake. Art should be utterly useless. Art, art should not point to anything beyond itself. Well, I'm not going to answer the question, but I'm going to simply pose the question for you. And uh, you may want to think about that. It's an interesting, it's an interesting problem. OK? All right. Well, let us now look at Ernest Dowson. Ernest Dowson is another one of the poets of the tail end of the 19th century, usually referred to simply as the 90s. But now that we've passed the, uh, the, the 1990s, you know, not to be confused with the 1990s, the 90s are the 1890s. And so Ernest Dowson has a famous poem called Cinera. Cinera. Okay. Now let's look at Cinera, but we're going to be talking as we were, at least to follow my suggestion, about a certain ambivalence in the 1890s. Remember what ambivalence means. It means having really mixed feelings, even contradictory feelings about the same thing at the same time. It's a term that we borrow from our friends, the psychologists. Okay, Cinera, famous poem, an example of the kind of decadence of the 90s, at least according to many of the critics. Last night, ah, yesterday, betwixt her lips and mine, there fell thy shadow. Cinera. Between her lips 
and mine. When I was kissing this woman, guess whose shadow came between this woman and me? You, Sinera. Sinera is going to be his former girlfriend, lover, whatever. We don't know exactly, at least not yet. There fell thy shadow, Sinera. Thy breath was shed upon my soul between the kisses and the wine that he's having with this other woman. And I was desolate and sick of an old passion. Yea, I was desolate and bowed my head. I have been faithful to thee, Sinera, in my fashion. Notice the in my fashion, the irony of the in my fashion. All night upon mine heart I felt her warm heart beat all night long. Presumably they're sleeping together. Night long within mine arms in love and sleep she lay. Surely the kisses of her bought her bought red mouth were sweet. Her bought red mouth. Well, at this point we can say, is this a prostitute or does he mean simply that he has bought her by, you know, giving her lots of presents and whatnot, you know? Okay. But I was desolate and sick of an old passion. When I awoke and found the dawn was gray, I have been faithful to thee, Sinera, in my fashion. I have forgot much, Sinera. Gone with the wind. Now you know where that expression comes from. <laughs> I mean, not that nobody had ever said gone with the wind before, but, uh, you know. Flung roses, roses riotously with the throng, dancing to put thy pale lost lilies out of mind. But I was desolate and sick of an old passion, Yea, all the time, because the dance was long. I have been faithful to thee, Sinera, in my fashion. I cried for madder music and for stronger wine. Now you know where that line comes from, which you've probably heard many times. I cried for madder music and for stronger wine. This is so he can forget Sinera, right? But when the feast is finished and the lamps expire, then falls thy shadow, Sinera. The night is thine. And I am desolate and sick of an old passion, yea, hungry for the lips of my desire. I have been faithful to thee, Sinera, in my fashion. Well, okay. Um... You know, what kind of attitude does this really express towards the kind of life that he's living? I mean, he's, he's living a life, you know, with music and wine and gaiety and wine, women and song and all of that sort of thing. And yet there's a sense of the emptiness of all this, right? Uh, because he no longer has Sinera. And the implication, at any rate, is that it is Sinera whom he has truly loved. Now, we don't know why she's no longer there, but he says, I have been faithful to thee, Sinera, in my fashion. And, of course, we don't know if that means now that she's no longer there, he's faithful to her memory in his fashion, which is not really very faithful in any conventional sense of the term? Or does this imply something backwards to when he and Sinera were actually together? Well, we don't know. We don't know. But there certainly are implications here in the poem. But look at the next one. They are not long. They are not long, the weeping and the laughter love and desire and hate, 
I think they have no portion in us after we pass the gate, whatever gate that is. Gate of life. They are not long the days of wine and roses. And there you go, another one, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the days of wine and roses. Out of a misty dream, our path emerges for a while, then closes within a dream. In other words, it's all unreal. It's all unreal. See what I mean by ambivalence? I mean, this is the kind of life he's chosen to live, but at the same time, he has very ambivalent feelings about it. Now notice the Carthusians. Remember the Carthusians? We talked about the Carthusians when we talked about Arnold's stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse, which was a monastery of Carthusian monks, which is a very, very, very severe order of monks who are recluses. They live apart from the world in order as fully as possible to give up the things of the body and the world in order to cultivate, they believe, the life of the spirit. And they do so to a far more serious or severe degree than other monks do. Carthusians. Through what long heaviness assayed in what strange fire have these white monks, these are monks who wear white garb, been brought into the way of peace? See, they're now in the way of peace, but through what long heaviness or in what strange fire were they provoked to come into the monastery where now they have this way of peace. Despising the world's wisdom and the world's desire, which from the body of this death bring no release. Within their austere walls, no voices penetrate. They have this vow of silence so that they don't speak to one another a sacred silence only, as of death, obtains. Nothing finds entry here of loud or passionate. This quiet is the exceeding profit of their pains. So yes, they've given up a lot, and they have to endure certain pains as a result, but notice the profit that they have gotten quiet, peace, some kind of spiritual balance. From many lands they came in diverse, fiery ways. Each knew at last the vanity of earthly joys, and one was crowned with thorns, and one was crowned with bays, and each was tired at last of the world's foolish noise. It was not theirs with Dominic to preach God's holy wrath. Dominic, St. Dominic, who founded the Dominican Order of Priests, devoted to going around preaching. They're preachers. They were too stern, that is to say the Carthusians, were too stern to bear sweet Francis's gentle sway. Francis. St. Francis of Assisi and the Franciscans. Theirs was a higher calling and a steeper path to dwell alone with Christ, to meditate and pray. A, cloist, a cloistered company, they are companionless. None knoweth here the secret of his brother's heart. See, the way a Carthusian house is set up is that it's actually a set of separate little houses, in effect. It's almost like a motel, uh, in the sense that you've got one dwelling after another, after another, after another, in a line or in a big rectangle. And uh, each one of the Carthusians enters his own little abode, and that's where he stays for the rest of his life. 
generally speaking. They do have some communal prayers and, and services, but most of the time one is simply in one's own little abode, all by oneself, by the way. And um, I actually went into the reconstruction of one of these in England one time. It's really interesting. They even had a little opening next to the door where you, the, a servant could pass a tray into, tray of food, into the, uh, this opening. But the opening was L-shaped so that then the guy who's inside, the monk who's inside, would reach and pull the tray along the other path into his, his little room. Uh, so that he never even had to have eye contact with the person who was delivering the food. And then, of course, he'd bring it back. And again, it would, the tray would go back through this L-shaped uh, opening to the, uh, the servant who would then take this away. And the one that I saw, the, uh, there was a very simple bed and a table and chair for writing or studying or whatever. And of course, there would be a Bible and perhaps some other religious works. And then there was a little garden, a little enclosed garden uh, area outside. And people were not under obligation to cultivate anything, but if they wanted to, they could cultivate something out there in this little garden area. So. Uh, Talk about a very, very, very austere life. But that's what he's talking about. And notice, he's talking about the peace that has come to these people. Now, notice what he's done in the other poems, and he alludes to here, is that out in the big world where the rest of us think that we're having fun, are we really having fun? And are we really, in any sense, at peace? They are but come together for more loneliness. See, they've come together in a sense they're a community, but they're a community of people who live apart from one another, whose bond is solitude and silence all their part. Oh, beatific life! Who is there shall gainsay your great refusal's victory, your little loss, deserting vanity, for the more perfect way, the sweeter service of the most dolorous cross. You shall prevail at last. Surely you shall prevail. Your silence and austerity shall win at last. Desire and mirth, the world's ephemeral light shall fail. The sweet star of your queen is never overcast. Your queen presumably being the Virgin Mary. We fling up flowers and laugh, we laugh across the wine. With wine we dull our souls and careful strains of art. Our cups are polished skulls round which the roses twine. None dares look at death who leers and lurks apart. Move on, white company, the monks whom that has not sufficed. Our vials cease, our violins, our instruments cease. Our wine is death, our roses fail. Pray for our heedlessness, O dwellers with the Christ. Though the world far apart, surely you shall prevail. Now there's an interesting issue that comes up here. Um, Notice that there's a reevaluation of not only the Middle Ages, but also of Catholicism, right? And then we go back to Wild, and we see in Wild, and I'm talking about the poems now, the Harlot's House and a Tenebris, a certain profound kind of ambivalence there. And a lot of people are shocked to learn that uh, at the end of his life, or toward the end of his life, uh, Wilde became a Roman Catholic. You know, and you go, well, what was that all about? 
Well, there's at least one wild scholar who was giving a lecture the other night um, here in town who was talking about this and was saying, you know, that's actually something that was really part of Wilde if you really trace his life all along. Despite all of the front that he put up, you know, there was another side to Wilde, a deeper side to Wilde. And that deeper side was, was not dismissible simply as Wilde out there enjoying the, the fun life or the decadent life and so forth. But those are the things that we tend to focus on when we talk about, about Wilde. For example, that, uh, that Wilde was fairly openly gay. Not totally, but fairly openly gay. And Wilde did have his affairs with other men. He was married, but, but he did have his affairs with, with other men. And in particular with uh, Bosey, who was a young aristocratic man uh, whose father objected to the relationship with Wilde, who confronted Wilde. And that's when Wilde got into the famous trials, because what he did was he filed suit for slander against the, uh, the, the father of Bosey, uh, whom he believed had slandered him as a sodomite, to use a very 19th century kind of word, and uh, come to find out that the, the, the defense against slander under English law and under American law, too, is to, uh, to prove the truth of whatever it was you said. And so that's what uh, the other side succeeded in doing. And so eventually, Wilde was found guilty. There, were, there was more than one trial. Was found guilty of uh, committing the, the act that uh, none dare name, as it was uh, described in the 19th century, and sent off to jail, okay, where he languished for a term in jail. And of course, that broke his health. And then he eventually came out of, of jail and uh, was apparently a quite changed person after he came out. Well, in any event, we tend to focus on those aspects of Wilde's life, and with good reason. And with good reason. I mean, that's the way Wilde presented himself and, and presented himself as a more or less public person. But there also is another side to Wild, and it's important, I think, to recognize that other side as well. And the same thing comes out here in the poetry of Dowson. You know, that, it, that things are more complicated than they might appear at first and on the surface. Okay, now, next, let's make a jump, because we're going to go into the 20th century. And in our next class, we're going to begin with a discussion of modernism. And as I said earlier, we're going to have long discussion of modernism using certain case studies for our discussion. But before we do that, I'd like to turn to some very, very interesting poets. The poets of World War I. These are English poets now, of World War I. Now, World War I was the most devastating war that humankind had ever, in its historical memory at least, experienced. Estimates run as high as 10 million people in Europe were killed in World War I. There were single battles in which you would have 80, 90, over 100,000 men killed in a single battle. Sometimes that many on each side in a single battle. And World War I was a different kind of war than people had fought before because, as you will no doubt remember from uh, your studies of history, 
This was a time of trench warfare. Now, what that meant was that you would have, say, the French or the British or, and then eventually American uh, lines after the United States got into World War I. But first, it was mainly the French and the, and the English who would establish a line. And the soldiers would be protected, more or less, by being in trenches. And those trenches were not just trenches. I mean, they were almost like underground towns because you would have command posts and whatnot, uh, you know, all underground, okay? But mainly the men were living in trenches and in the wet seasons, that meant that the trenches would turn into basins where water would collect and they were just mud and rats would come in, and there were all kinds of horrible vermin and, and insects, lice, that would be gnawing away at the men. And in addition to that, they would be ordered out of the trenches to attack the army in trenches a few hundred yards away from them, having to cross what in World War I was called no man's land. And you will recall that by this time, the machine gun had not just been invented. I mean, it was invented in the, uh, the middle of the 19th century, but had been perfected. So here would be these guys racing across no man's land, no protection whatsoever, often being confronted with barbed wire that they would have to get over or under Actually, what often happened was that they were taught for one soldier to throw himself, throw his body across the barbed wire, and then the other soldiers ran up his body like a ramp over the barbed wire. And in the midst of machine gun fire, okay? And so you would have literally tens of thousands of people killed in one of these charges alone. And then the next time, it wouldn't be the French and or the British, it would be the Germans that would be ordered by their officers out of the trenches to attack the, uh, the French and Germans, or the French and, uh, and English. And then they'd be, you know, decimated, tens of thousands of their people being killed. Well, people not only during the war who actually experienced the war, now I'm not talking about people far away, but people who actually experienced the war came out of it totally changed. And World War I really changed Western European cultural mentality in a very, very, very fundamental way. Now, to some extent that affected Americans but not as much because we were so remote from it. I mean, over here in another continent, protected by our oceans, you know, we didn't have to worry about the, the direct effects. I mean, if you were in France and you're a farmer in France, I mean, here come the tanks and here come the soldiers and they're digging trenches right across your, your fields and they're taking over your house to use as a command post. And artillery shells are falling all over the place. And where do you go? There's no place to go, except to try to get as far behind the lines as you possibly can, away from the big cannons. But of course, that means that you're leaving your home behind. So many of the 10 million people who were killed were civilians, were civilians. So there were, of course, lots of Americans who went over, not only during the war, but also then after the war and went to Paris and places like Berlin and so forth. Uh, and they got caught up in this kind of culture, you know, which people were saying, the world just isn't what we were brought up to think it was. We were brought up to believe in all kinds of ideals, including the idealism of heroism in war. And this is how you prove your mettle and that you are 
a real man and that you have real courage. And war makes people. And these people came out of World War I saying, <coughs> if they survived, saying, this is just crazy. In effect, we've been lied to. We've been betrayed. And remember also, this was a time of gas warfare. Horrible, horrible effects of mustard gas. You know what mustard gas does to the human body? What happens is that blisters form. You, you breathe it in if you can't get your big gas mask on, if you happen to have one, if you can't get it on. Um, and you breathe in the mustard gas. What happens is that in your lungs, you know, all the little air sacs in your lungs, blisters form. Now, that not only means that it cuts off large parts of your lungs so that uh, you can no longer breathe in enough air, but that those blisters will eventually break, probably sooner than later, and you are drowning in your own bodily fluids. Okay, plus, of course, the searing pain inside your lungs that's creating the blisters in the first place. It was so horrible, so absolutely horrible that after World War I, all nations that had been involved, and including nations that had not been involved, signed an international agreement that they would never use gas warfare of this kind again, period. And in World War II, nobody did. I mean, it's amazing. Even when, you know, armies were losing the war, they never used gas as a defensive weapon. I mean, that's how horrible it was. And that's how horrible the memory was. Because the thought was, well, if we use gas, then they're going to come back at us with gas, too. And that's just too horrible to contemplate. Which is not to say that there weren't horrors in World War II, but at least that one was avoided. And, you know, I can remember as a child, there was a man who lived across the street from us who was a veteran of World War I. And he was uh, in his 70s at the time, and he'd survived. But he had to go to the VA hospital uh, every week for treatments. You know, otherwise, presumably, he would have either become, you know, completely infirm as an invalid or died. So, so what are the attitudes? We're going to be looking at these poets who themselves were soldiers. Themselves were soldiers. And it's, it's hard for us to imagine. I remember one time uh, being in a, uh, in, a, in a French cathedral and uh, looking, there was a little plaque on one of the columns. And I don't know what it was that draw, drew my eye to it, but it was just a plain plaque. And what it said in French was that this plaque was dedicated in this part of the church was dedicated to the million and a half, million and a half British soldiers who died fighting on French soil. Just the British. Okay. I once I saw a presentation in which uh, the person who was doing the presentation went through the school roles for, uh, for secondary schools, what we would call secondary schools, in England, and was showing how many people had survived. So you'd have like, I mean, they don't have quite the same grade system that we do, but let's say you had the 10th and 11th and 12th grades in an American high school, or the equivalent in an English school. Uh, well, the 12th graders would graduate and they'd go into the army, right? Well, the 11th graders are just one year behind going into the army, and the 10th graders, and so forth. And what this person did was take a, a three-year band like that and go through the school 
roles of these schools in England. And there would be one school in which, say, nobody had survived from those three classes, another school in which three or four people had survived, or half a dozen. We went through school roles after school roles after school roles. I mean, it was a whole generation that was wiped out, in effect. And those who survived were permanently scarred in all kinds of ways that we're only beginning to understand. They didn't understand things like battle fatigue and the terrible uh, post-traumatic effects that can take place for people with people who have been through combat, you know, under these horrible, horrible conditions. We don't still completely understand it, but we understand it at least a little bit better than it was understood in World War I. And while we may not be terribly successful all the time in dealing with it, at least we recognize the problem and are trying to find ways of dealing with it. Okay, well, having said all of that, let us first of all look at Rupert Brooke. Rupert Brooke, writing very, very early, is this poem, very, very early in the war, still filled with some sense of the cause with a capital C, and that that being worthwhile and worth all of the risk, even the risk of death. So look at his poem, The Soldier. Those of you who are looking at the seventh edition, it's on page 2050. The Soldier. If I should die, think only this of me. By the way, this is a sonnet again, isn't it? If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed. A dust, you know, this is reminding us of the, uh, the biblical phrase about you know, how we were created out of dust. Adam was created out of dust, and man thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return, and so forth. Okay. A dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam. A body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. And think this heart all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind. Think of this heart, see if I die, as now joined in some sense to the eternal mind. No less gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given. Her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter learn to friends, and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. Now notice the poem is not only strongly patriotic, but it also is very idealistic about having to serve in the war, even to the point of contemplating his own death and describing that with a kind of idealism, right? He will have done his duty, but also he will somewhere, wherever he might be buried, he will somewhere still be part of England. And everybody's seen pictures. I mean, maybe you've been there, but uh, everybody's seen pictures of these mass uh, cemeteries in Europe in which you'll have all of the white uh, crosses and stars of David uh, you know that go on for miles and miles and miles it seems for all of the people from the different nationalities who have died there okay
Now let's look over at Siegfried Sassoon. Okay. Sassoon didn't die. He was one of the lucky ones. Uh, and, I mean, the lucky ones in the sense that he survived at any rate. So, uh, look at his poem, They. The bishop tells us, when the boys come back, they will not be the same, for they'll have fought in a just cause. They lead the last attack on Antichrist. On Antichrist. And uh, while none of us here are old enough to remember World War I, uh, you've probably seen some of the, of oh, the placards that were around and the posters that were around, and you've read about this, that uh, you know the Germans were called the Huns and barbarians and the Antichrist and so forth, and people often used to sing "Onward, Christian Soldiers," at least among the, the British soldiers, as they would go marching off to war. They lead the last attack on Antichrist. Their comrades' blood has bought new right to breed an honorable race. They have challenged death and dared him face to face. This is what the bishop is telling the young soldiers. We're none of us the same, the boys reply. Okay, just as the bishop had said, we're not, we're, none of us are, are the same. For George lost both his legs and Bill's stone blind. You know, when one of those artillery shells went off right in front of you, you know, you could lose your eyesight. You could have your eyes literally burned out. Poor Jim's shot through the lungs and liked to die. And Bert's gone syphilitic. Bishop probably didn't want to hear that. You'll not find a chap who served that hasn't found some change. And the bishop said, the ways of God are strange. Notice how this is similar in a way to what Blake was doing with his uh, chimney sweep and Holy Thursday poems, in which he's talking about hypocrisy. Well, here too, that's what Sassoon is dealing with, right? His hypocrisy. Okay. And look at, oh, say, the general. Good morning, good morning, the general said when we met him last week on our way to the line. Now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead and were cursing his staff for incompetent swine. He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack as they slogged up to Eris with rifle and pack. But he did for them both by his plan of attack. And this is one of the things that made people so angry is that the general staff on both sides, on both sides, appear to have been just almost totally incompetent. And what they were doing out of this, this madness and this obsession with uh, how they could overcome their opponents simply with the force of throwing more and more and more and more soldiers at them is they would make these insane orders of ordering everybody out of the trenches, tens of thousands of soldiers at a time, to charge across no man's land under withering fire from the enemy. And this wasn't just the French, it wasn't just the British, it was also the Germans as well. Okay? The glory of women. You love us when we're heroes, home on leave. 
or wounded in a mentionable place, not wounded in an unmentionable place. You worship decorations. You believe that chivalry, as if it were chivalry, redeems the war's disgrace. This is not, you know, some great cheering uh, patriotism, is it? The war's disgrace. You make us shells, okay? You make the shells for, I mean, in the sense that the women were working in the factories, making the shells for the, the cartridges and for the, uh, the artillery shells. But perhaps also this means shells in the other sense of shells, okay? That you could become a shell of a person, just a surface and nothing else. You listen with delight by tales of dirt and danger fondly thrilled. You crown our distant ardors while we fight and mourn our laureled memories when we're killed. Laureled, the laurel, you know, you probably, anybody here who cooks knows what bay leaves are. Well, bay leaves are also from the laurel. I mean, the laurel is the other word for the bay. And uh, in ancient Roman times, what they would do is they would make a circle of the, the stem of the, uh, of the bay or laurel. And that was a crown that they would put on the head of someone who had performed some great heroic deed in battle or in some kind of gymnastic contest. And that's where the expression comes from. Uh, to win the laurels and so forth. You can't believe that British troops retire, quote, retire, okay, which means run like hell. When hell's last horror breaks them and they run, trampling the terrible corpses blind with blood. Oh, German mother dreaming by the fire while you are knitting socks to send your son. His face is trodden deeper in the mud. Notice there's a sympathy for the German mother too. Not just, this is not just, oh, us English guys, we got to, you know, get together and get through this. What about the, you know, feeling for the people on the other side? I mean, after all, they didn't ask for it either. That's what All Quiet of the Western Front is about. The, the people from both sides learning that they've gotten caught up in a war that was not of their making, but they're the ones who are having to suffer and to die. Okay, now let's flip over to Wilfred Owen. Okay, go back to the screen just for a moment. I just want to put this on there mainly for the people who are watching this at a distance because they can use this for queuing up the different sections. Well, now we're going to go on to Wilfred Owen. And what I'd like to do is particularly to focus, given however much time we've got, on dulce et decorum est, which is the footnote points out it's from a, uh, a line from Horace. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori is the full line, which I don't think is in our line here. Anyway, it means it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and toward our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on, bloodshod, all went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped, five nines, these are cannons, that dropped behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. 
but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or a line. He can't get his gas mask on. Dim through the misty panes, these are the eye panes of the gas mask, and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. We're going to see this kind of vision again in Virginia Woolf, by the way, in Mrs. Dalloway. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. Remember what I said about mustard gas. If in some smothering dreams you two could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. You could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend... You would not tell with, with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Well, okay. Uh, you know, notice that Sassoon and Owen were there, and they're telling it like it really is or really was. And that's absolutely remarkable poetry. And notice how deeply, deeply moving and deeply, deeply troubling this is. And this affected, as I said, a whole generation. And we're going to be talking about that beginning in our next class.